Hello, Monetization Nation. I'm Nathan Gwilym, your host, and today I'm joined by John Jantz. John is a marketing consultant, speaker, and author of multiple books, including Duct Tape Marketing. He is also the founder of the Duct Tape Marketing Consultant Network, which trains and licenses independent consultants and agencies to use the duct tape methodology. In today's episode, we're going to discuss duct tape marketing. We'll also cover the following key takeaways. Number one, duct tape marketing is centered around the idea that marketing starts with strategy before tactics. Number two, nobody wants what we sell. They want their problems solved. Our core message should be focused on solving our customers' problems. Number three, the customer journey doesn't end with a purchase. We want to continue building a relationship with our customers so they refer to us again and again. Number four, if we want to be referred, we should exceed expectations. Number five, we should focus on one or two channels instead of trying to be on every one. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. Oh, thanks for having me. My pleasure. So can you start off by sharing with us something that you are super passionate about? Super passionate about, gosh, there's, is, are there any topics off limits? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm really passionate about baseball. Um, <laughs> I'm really passionate about woodworking. I have a little, little uh, woodwork shop. Uh, but from a business standpoint, um, I, I think, I'm not sure if this is a passion as much as a skill maybe, but I, I really find that there's a lot of use in when I can take complex topics and make them uh, simple. Uh, so there's a bit of a passion to to kind of unpack things that way that to, to simplify things. Okay. Can you share with us one of the greatest success stories or home runs that you've hit in your career? Hmm. I, you know, this is going to sound really weird, but um, I, I, you know, it's been proven of, I mean, choosing the name duct tape marketing has actually been one of the, one of the best business decisions I've ever made. It, it was not a fully researched, um, you know, uh, idea. It actually evolved. Uh, it was actually the name of, I, I decided I was going to change my approach to marketing and, and really focus on this idea of a system with small businesses. It was going to almost be like a product. And so I thought, well, I, I need a producty name. And so I came up with my approach to, to be called duct tape marketing. That's what people were buying almost like a product. It resonated so well with the business owners, the small business owners that I was approaching that it eventually became certainly my website, my podcast. My first book is called Duct Tape Marketing. I have a network of independent marketing consultants who call themselves Duct Tape Marketing. It's the name of my business. Um, so I would have to say that that decision, uh, snap as it was uh, in the moment, uh, probably served me uh, as well as anything I've ever done. So you're talking about repurposing content. Um, do you have a key takeaway or strategy about how we can be a little more effective in our, our uh, content repurposing. Yeah. I I tell you the secret weapon that I use, and again, maybe it's not that much of a secret, but I don't see enough people using it is Google search console is one of your best friends for repurposing content. Um, And the reason I say that is because it's the one place where you get the voice of Google telling you exactly what they think of your content, uh, exactly how they rank it, uh, exactly what is linked to it, exactly, um, you know, where it was six months ago (laughs) compared to where it is today. And so I typically, when looking for for repurposing content, I want I want to repurpose that content, yes, to make it better, maybe to give it another use. But let's face it, today, a lot of what we're doing with content is also to earn search engine uh, ranking. And so I use Google Search Console to find those nuggets that I think I could, hey, this is, this is you know, this is on the top of page two what would it take to get it to the top of page one, as opposed to just thinking, oh, I've, you know, I haven't repurposed these five blog posts for a long time. I'll, uh, you know, I'll just try to do something to improve them. I want to take the things that are already giving me a result of some fashion and and really go all in on them so that they turn into a real workhorse for me. Okay. Um, what do you believe is one of the biggest tectonic shifts that is transforming the business landscape today? To me, it's the one that's not talked about enough. You know, everybody wants to talk about all these changes in marketing and new platforms and all these things. I think the tectonic shift is in how people choose to become customers. That's what's changed the most. And that I think is marketers, what we have to pay attention to, you know, kind of that linear create demand, you know, shove people down the, the, the funnel and turn them into loyal customers. I mean, most 
buyers today are not going to pick up a phone or fill out a form or, you know, ask for somebody to come call on them till they've done a lot of research on their own, till they've covered a lot of the customer journey without us even knowing about them. And so I think it, to me, it, it, it very much signals how we have to be, we have to be guiding behaviors that people want to participate in rather than uh, trying to create demand and, and, you know, have customers follow the, and do what we want them to do. Well, let's ask one more. There's one tectonic shift we talk a lot about on this show and it's called credibility marketing. So uh, finding more credible voices than ourselves to, to talk to our customers instead of trying to tell the world that we're awesome. Uh, what do you believe? Did you have any stories or examples of credibility marketing? Yeah. So, so I wrote a book called The Referral Engine in 2009. And essentially, you know, that's what we're talking about. We, we call it influencer marketing or credibility marketing or word of mouth marketing. What we're really talking about is, is approaches that get people to talk about us in a favorable way. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of people that are paying, you know, what they see as influencers to talk about us. And I think in some cases, people understand what that is. And I don't necessarily... I wouldn't attach the word credibility, <laughs> you know, always to that form of marketing. But the true form of credibility marketing to me is when people are surprised, uh, people's uh, expectations are exceeded. Um, and so they, they want to talk about you. You know, I have a lot of deals pitched to me, people wanting to sponsor my podcast, people, you know, wanting to, to, to have sponsored guest blog posts and things. And, you know, Anybody who who does, you know, any form of influencer marketing or, you know, any form of trust building or community building, you know, realizes that uh, the, the, the probably the biggest thing you have to do is is be true to that audience. And so when we get pitched things that aren't a good fit. You know, in some cases, if we're not offended, we may we may think, OK, yeah, that's reasonable. We'll promote that product. But I tell you the ones that we really I mean, the products I use, the ones that I love, the companies that just create such great experiences. I want to talk about them. Um, and and it, and it comes across. People believe me when I talk about them because they, they I think people can read through when you're BSing something or when you're truly authentically excited about something. So what? tips or strategies could you give us for how we can create that referral engine? Well, I, I think it starts, uh, quite frankly, so, so many people uh, think that it starts with some referral hack, you know, some way in which you ask people or some way in which you give them a button to push. But it really starts with being referable. And and that happens actually in, throughout the entire customer journey. Um, I write about something in, really in all of my books called The Marketing Hourglass. And that to me is is a more, a, a true depiction of what the customer journey today looks like. And if you think about the, the hourglass metaphor, you know, the shape is like a funnel. Um, uh, there's nothing wrong inherently with that. Uh, we do have to get uh, some percentage of the market to know we exist and, and some smaller percent to realize they're ideal customers. But so many marketers, that's that's really where it ends. It's like that's, that's the end goal is to get somebody to become a customer. Um, the hourglass shape takes that funnel at the top and flips it over and suggests that, hey, when somebody buys, uh, when they, you know, want to buy more, <laughs> um, when they want to, you know, refer their friends that, that, that we need to develop intentional marketing processes and campaigns, uh, around, you know, creating that around guiding them, you know, through the stages of doing that as, as well. Um, so, you know, to me, um, you have to have that complete end to end journey. Those stages of no like trust, try by repeat and then refer <laughs> happens because somebody uh, not only finds you, finds your message credible, um, finds a buying experience uh, in the first place, one that matched what they expected, but then finds the actual experience of doing business with you, something that surprises them, that uh, exceeds their expectations. That's what leads to referrals. Now, you have to also intentionally ask people, <laughs> stay top of mind, you know, make it easy for them uh, to refer you, you know, give them, in some cases, the right incentive you know, to, you know, to be motivated to refer you. But it all starts first and foremost. We're not, gonna, we're not going to refer a, a company that... that uh, gives us a, you know, a bad experience, maybe not even one that gives us a satisfactory experience. We're going to talk about those companies that exceed our, our expectations. 
Can you share with us the example, an example of a company that's done a really good job of building a referral engine? Oh, um, I would say the one of the ones that I like to talk about all the time, and and this is interesting too because I don't necessarily think that um, the when when people think about referrals, you know, they're they're thinking about you know, the service professional that you say, oh yeah, you should hire my accountant if you're looking for an accountant. They're really great. Um, we don't often think about product companies as in that same vein, but one of my favorites is is Patagonia uh, to talk about. And, and the reason I say that is because I, they don't have a referral offer. I don't get anything by talking about them. You know, I don't, uh, I don't get anything when I buy Christmas gifts for all my friends, you know, for them. Um, but they've built such a strong story, such a strong, credible brand, um, such a, a great customer experience. Yeah, the products are great, you know, but they work, they function, but it's everything they do around them. It's, it's how they merchandise them. It's who they associate with from a, reseller standpoint it's their it's their buyback program it's their send it to us to get you know repair program so because we you know we believe in sustainability you know that story and that brand promise makes me want to talk about them and i do often the first secret of being referable and building a referral engine is to be referable is to build a business that amazes people that they want to share with others yep absolutely uh, let's move on to your duct tape marketing book can you just Give us a quick overview of what is duct, duct tape marketing. Well, probably the point of view that that has um, that that informed that book, but also has really informed my work. I mean, and one of the things that maybe is a little different about me than some authors, I don't like research a thing and then decide to write about it. I I just write about what I do every day. <laughs> and so I, you know, had a marketing consulting practice. Um, I was struggling with how to differentiate my business. I landed on this idea of marketing as a system, um, which is still kind of a foreign and innovative concept uh, at the time. I, because I wanted to give it a name, that's where the name duct tape marketing came from. But essentially uh, the point of view is that marketing is a system. It starts with strategy before tactics. Um, and that if we truly create a, 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 a strategy for our marketing around an, a narrowly defined ideal customer, um, a core message of solving, you know, that ideal customer's problem, that, you know, after that, then we can start using the things we think about as, as tactics, our website, our content, our SEO, you know, really as just a, a, a way to um, communicate um, our strategy and our beliefs for our company. So that that's essentially what it was. It certainly, you know, once we develop a marketing strategy, we certainly then, you know, tick off the various channels that, you know, that company needs to be in. Uh, you know, the book was actually written in 2007. You know, social media was brand new. This idea of content marketing was probably the term, you know, no one was really using yet, um, even though content was, you know, a great deal of how I built my business. Um, I, the, the thing I've always contended is that, you know, if you have the right strategy, you know, that part's never changed. What we're here to do as marketers really has never changed. You know, I mean, our job as marketers is get somebody to, to know about our company and, and trust our company enough that they want to uh, exchange, you know, some monetary value, you know, for some value in exchange. That part will never, ever change. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's more about understanding that and less about understanding the tactics that we surround, um, you know, our, our marketing with. But probably to, to sum it up uh, in a nutshell, it's that idea that marketing is a system and we have to view it like we do every other system in our business. Okay, so what are the steps of this duct tape marketing system? Yeah. So the first, as I said, strategy before tactics. So what we do in that is, uh, you know, when we work with somebody um, to develop a strategy, first we'll understand and help them narrow who, you know, the focus, their ideal customer. Uh, a lot of times uh, it's a matter of looking at the profitability of their customers, looking at their customers that already refer business and understanding who they actually deliver the most value to. And in some cases, you know, the bottom 20, 30% of that <laughs> Um, equation, probably they should stop doing business with. Um, because uh, in my experience, you know, most people say, look, if I do basement foundations and I own equipment that can do excavating and driveways and all this stuff, you know, I should tell people I do all this stuff. Um, and I'm using an actual example of a company that we worked with and, and I talk about it in the book. Um, we started working with them and we discovered that 80% of their profits came from one service. 
um, and about 20% of their client base. It was basement waterproofing. And yet their website literally had 27 services that they could offer, some of which they'd actually never done before. <laughs> but, you know, they had the equipment, so why not put it on there? Don't want to turn anybody away. Well, they were the best in their community at basement waterproofing. You'd never know it. Uh, you had to you had to really dig through, you know, a lot of stuff to figure that out. So when we simplified it, said, look, these are the three services that make up 90% of your, your profit. This is all you do. <laughs> this is who you serve. You know, this is where you serve them. This is why you charge a premium for what you do because you're the best at it. It, it doubled, they doubled their business in the first, you know, 18 months of, of working with us and just getting this idea of narrowing their focus. Now, the second thing we do is, is we, we help them understand, we create a core message uh, that is based in the problem that they solve for their ideal customer. Um, I always like to tell people, nobody wants what we sell. They want their problem solved. <laughs> and if we can help them understand that we get them, we can help them actually define their problem, but certainly that, that we know what their problem is, we get it, they'll give us the opportunity to connect that back to our solution. If we're out there just selling our solution, a lot of times they, they don't see what our solution is going to do for them. Uh, quite often when we, when I first started doing this and developing the system, I used to really just rely on the customer. Like, what do you do that's different? What do you do? What problem do you solve for your uh, clients? And, and what I discovered pretty quickly is they don't know in most cases, <laughs> you know, they're still, they're, they're, all of the marketing that they've seen is everybody talking about themselves and their business and their great solutions. We started interviewing their customers and it was immediately eye opening, you know, the different story we were hearing. Um, it was the customers could almost always say, well, here's what they do that's different. Now, in the last few years, uh, five years or so, particularly, almost every industry now relies on Google reviews. So uh, another rich vein of truly understanding the problem uh, that you solve for your uh, customers. And it's never about the product or service. The example I have in the book is uh, a tree service that we worked with all over the, you know, above the fold on their website, been in business since 1960, family owned, local, you know, business in the community, all nice things. <laughs> we interviewed their customers, we looked at their reviews, and they almost all said they show up when they say they're going to and they clean up the job site. <laughs> Rarely did anybody talk about how incredible it was that they cut down a tree. You got a truck, you got a chainsaw, you could probably cut down a tree, right? <laughs> but will you show up when you say you will? Are you going to make me wait around for four hours waiting for you to get there? When I come home after work is, you know, is it going to be a mess, you know, in my backyard? So we take that, you know, findings and we make that their core message, but then we make that their strategy because, you know, we develop the on-time guarantee, you know, process as, you know, part of their sales process. As part of their marketing materials, we have the 27 point, you know, checklist to make sure that, you know, the job site is cleaned up. So discovering that problem that, that, you know, that, that, that your ideal customer, you know, the one that goes to Google and leaves a five-star review is, is plainly saying is the problem you solve for them, um, is, is what we turn into quite often the strategy. And, and I will say, a lot of times we get pushback on that because a lot of times it's the simple stuff. It's not the sexy stuff. You know, it's the stuff they're just not getting from other, other companies or other people in their lives. Uh, but there's real gold in, in discovering that message because then we can, we can build the entire business really around that. From that point, you know, quite frankly, now what we're going to do is we're going to map out that customer journey. You know, what, what are the stages? You know, how do we guide the, your customer all the way through wanting to be a referral? Uh, what, what initiatives, what campaigns, what content, you know, are we going to need to guide people through those stages? After we develop that strategy, that foundation, it really becomes a game of finding, okay, what are the most effective channels that we now need to explore in order to help guide people on that customer journey? I love that. And I, I specifically love the point you made about going to reviews and finding the most common reasons people are leaving you positive reviews and then build guarantees and brand promises and things around those. I, I don't think I've ever heard that before. And and that's, that's brilliant. I love it. I, I tell you, you know, we, we, sometimes it's just smacks you in the face. Like this is what should be above the fold on the website, but there's also you find lots of topics for blog posts. You find subject headlines for emails. Um, you can 
you can look at competitors and learn a lot, a great deal about what they're doing that you're not. Uh, you can find things that they're doing that don't generate positive reviews that you can maybe exploit. Uh, I, I, I actually advise people, especially local businesses, find, you know, well-known sort of aspirational companies. You don't compete with them, but you'd like to be them um, in other parts of the country and read over their reviews too, because in, in some cases, you know, you're, you're going to start seeing some patterns and some themes emerge that could actually point to some things that you should be doing. Yeah. I really like that. And I like how you said, look at competitors, look at their bad reviews, why they're getting bad reviews and maybe build around solving those problems. Yeah. We, we won't leave you doing X, Y, Z, you know, because you know, the competitors, um, you know, seem to have a reputation for that. Thanks for taking us through that. What are the main benefits of implementing duct tape marketing? Well, one of the things that I think, uh, whether it's duct tape marketing or you just, did, you just kind of really embrace this idea of strategy is an effective strategy tells you what to do. But the biggest benefit is it tells you what not to do. Um, I think one of the challenges in, in for a lot of people, a lot of the stress for a lot of marketers is they're like, oh my God, I got to be on this channel and they want content in these eight ways. And I got to be on this new channel and this new channel. It's like, we can't effectively be everywhere. Um, first off, our target market's probably not everywhere. So you can cross you know, some, some channels off you know, right away. But you're far more, most businesses will, will see far more traction by going deep in one, maybe two channels and really perfecting it, you know, really owning it, really being there for the long haul. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't make shifts and add things once you get that one channel down, but don't try to just scatter yourself in eight channels uh, because you, you really won't have any impact in any of them. So go deep, master one, and then maybe add another. Can you give me a case study of a business that implemented duct tape marketing and the results that they saw from it? This is a remodeling contractor that I've worked uh, with since 2004. So that's another aspect of, of really this idea of viewing marketing as a system. I mean, you're never done with marketing. <laughs> um, it just continues to evolve and mature. Um, so the fact that I've been actually able to work with one company for, you know, 17, 18 years is sort of testament to, to that approach. Um, like so many business, I mean, they were a very uh, typical business. They had a website, you know, this was early on in the days of, you know, the, the digital space was not as important as it is uh, today. They had a website, but no real message. Uh, they, they actually would, uh, they would do a $50,000 kitchen and they'd come out and fix your gutter if it was hanging, you know, off your house a little bit. So they, anybody who called them you know, <laughs> that needed a hammer, they had a hammer. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we very first thing of course, was got them to realize that their most profitable customers were those up, you know, upscale upper end remodeling jobs. They did a great job with those, but you know, their website pretty much looked like a dollar 99. Uh, so, you know, we certainly changed their messaging to focus on what, uh, what those more upscale buyers cared about. Those upscale buyers really cared about the experience about, they cared about, you know, your design background. So really promoted the fact that they actually had an architect, no other remodeling contractor in their community had an architect on staff. So they were able to really focus on design and build and uh, upscale, you know, projects. So narrowed their focus, um, got, turned their whole messaging around to, to be about the experience. So changed their messaging. Uh, this was uh, the early days of blogging. I, I would say that they were probably the first uh, uh, remodeling contractor blogging, <laughs> maybe in the country. Uh, uh, but 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 more than that, and today I don't even talk about blogging. It's really just about content creation that's going to be useful. Uh, it's not about blogging, you know, anymore. The the blog tool, as we all know, is just a content management system. So essentially, got them, uh, you know, creating content on a consistent basis. They're a visual industry, so we really you know did a lot with video, just showcases of their projects. So they they. You know they own SEO uh, for their community, and and you know probably can't be knocked off of that position because of the the base that they've built. And and for, well, let's face it, they're not in necessarily a competitive marketing you know industry necessarily. Um, so really got them to embrace content, and and really from there started adding channels. I mean, social media, Facebook's actually a great channel for a remodeling contractor. They've you know invested the time in that, but they're not really in LinkedIn. They're not really in uh, Twitter. They certainly haven't gone to TikTok uh, because. They, they get a lot of engagement in, in that, you know, one channel or that one social channel. 
We did a lot of things. I mean, that, that, that are, you know, very common parts of our practice, but so uh, overlooked by, you know, many businesses. They had a customer list of 1,800 uh, past customers. They'd never sent them anything, <laughs> you know, in, in, in years. I mean, if the person picked up the phone, called them, said, we need you to do another project, they're like, sure, we can do that. Um, so, you know, very robust you know, now program, staying in touch, getting reviews, you know, getting referrals, you know, as part of, of, of their ongoing kind of sales process. So, you know, they are, uh, they are a pretty prototypical example of, you know, this idea of marketing as a system. Um, you know, today that industry, um, like many industries, um, hiring has actually become a huge deal for them. Um, or I should say the lack of their ability <laughs> to hire. And, uh, you know, the nice thing about that is that, is essentially marketing. I know a lot of people have hiring in HR, but it's really a, a marketing. It's an employer branding. It's a culture uh, issue as much as it is an HR function. And so, you know, today um, uh, where we stand in in the end, uh, the back end of 2021, um, we've shifted a great deal of this same systematic approach to appealing to um, uh, you know an employee and and really really making their company see not seem making their company uh, communicate its values and and you know its culture and what they stand for to uh, a workforce that you know is increasingly thinking maybe blue collar work is not that cool um, and so you know that's. That's, I, I think one of the things that when you embrace this idea of marketing as a system, there's a lot of ways that you can go with that when you realize that the these, these system has a lot of integrated uh, parts. Thank you so much, John, for sharing your stories and insights with us today. To learn more about or connect with John, you can find him on YouTube. You can check out his books on Amazon and you can visit his website at theultimatemarketingengine.com. And there's links to each of those sites in the blog post for this episode on our website. You can also get a free copy of my ebook, Passion Marketing, and learn how you can become a top priority of your ideal customers at passionmarketing.com. Thanks for joining me for this episode, and I wish you success in your duct tape marketing. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.